when you start working somewhere, you just check for skills and then you can start because we know it's all about facts, isn't it? So first, it is about facts. However, at work, you know that there's more than just checking for skills. We know that there's one principle always check for skills because skills are important. However, skills on their own are not enough. There has to be a cultural fit. The main issue here is the cultural fit is very hard to find, very hard to ask for, very hard to check if it's really a fit for your organization. And it's very hard to communicate what actually is your working culture. So the main problem is how do you communicate this to the market on which people now are looking for jobs? Or, well, probably you are more looking for talent than they are looking for jobs, especially at the moment. Cultural fit, cultural intelligence, there's a higher relevance of the so-called CQ the cultural quotient. Probably you heard of EQ, that's the emotional intelligence, emotional quotient by Daniel Goldman. And you know IQ for intelligence quotient, that's about how smart you are. But now we have to check, how can you talk about your culture? Because we all know in an interview that the honesty is not where it should be. Everyone says we're the best organization. We really love you to work here. Amazing job, amazing people, amazing benefits. Could you please start by tomorrow? And that is an interchangeable, completely arbitrary, very random list of always the same items you are repeating and you're completely comparable to anyone on the market offering probably either better benefits or simply better payment. So what would what do we need to know about the CQ, the cultural quotient, about the cultural intelligence? There are four main aspects we have to talk about. And these four aspects have a couple of subsets, a couple of sub ideas, which we need to talk about as well. So step number one is the aspect number one is the behavioral aspect. First, there is the verbal aspect. That's that's that that's the first sub part of it. The verbal is the, the, the verbal aspect is what people tell you the culture is going to be and also how people act on the culture. So when you have verbal statements, especially during interviews or in marketing situations where people talk about uh, your, your culture, you will, of course, always check if you find any kind of cues, anything that looks suspicious, anything where you think, Uh, The body language of the people in the room doesn't really resemble what they say here. There is a very weird silence in the room right now. So probably it is not as great as they say. Of course, there can always be misunderstandings or you overinterpret situations. Uh, But we come to the second subset, the second sub idea of the behavioral aspect. It's the nonverbal part. The nonverbal part is what you see, hear and feel. The emotional part of what you think or what you think you see or really see when it comes to the culture of an organization, because verbal often is marketing talk. And we all know that, of course, intentions can be nice and marketing plans can be great. And there are these posters on the wall that tell you, oh, we're the best organization and the customer pays my salary. These motivational, inspirational posters, which are painful to read, although the core message of them is not wrong. It's just painful to tell people what when you say that the customer pays their their salary, people are aware of that. We are in the year 2023. Of course they are. So the third aspect of behavioral is speech acts. And speech act means what do you really see that happens in the organization? I lost count of the situations where I'm in an interim management position or I deliver a seminar or a workshop and the organization tells me up front, and it's all about respect and the people are the most important asset we have and we well we we value everyone working here and the workshop is just about to start and we go into the first aspect of how to be a more attractive employer and immediately a senior executive says you know all these young entitled people no one wants to work anymore they're all lazy and as soon as you just tell them what the work is like and what they have to do they're all stressed out call in sick and next week they have a burnout Not only, by the way, that is a word by word quotation of someone who said in a coaching with me just about a year ago. And of course, I'm going to keep the organization and the person's details private. However, speech acts tell you, where are you? Where is the organization really located when it comes to culture? Because speaking about culture is one aspect. Nonverbal cues is the second aspect. But speech acts is what you really see in your organization or in the, is the, the organization you probably think of working in. These speech acts is what shows you what the culture really is. And of course, there are more aspects to it. That is the first part. Behavioral with the subsets of verbal, nonverbal and speech acts. The second one is motivational. And motivational tells you how interested are they really into having a great culture at work. 
So subset number one, sub idea number one, part number one is intrinsic motivation. How interested are people really, and especially management and executives, senior leaders, board level, or supervisory boards for the board, then you can look at what they say as soon as they talk about culture. When they, for example, say, well, we have to offer this culture thing because, you know, people today are so whiny that they that they can't handle when you give them a simple set of tasks. Or when, when you have a bit of management tough talk, they all say, oh, this is so rude, I'm going to quit. And statements like this show you that there is no intrinsic motivation. And the first subset is the intrinsic motivation. When the, intri when the intrinsic motivation is not genuine, you will fail. When you have no intrinsic motivation talking about culture, then please give the job to someone else. You can still be a manager and good at what you do or an executive and be brilliant at what you do, but don't talk about culture when you have no intrinsic motivation to do so. The second subset, the second sub idea is extrinsic. The extrinsic factor of motivational of the, of the motivational part is what the market gives you. And at the, at the moment, the market gives you a massive talent shortage. <laughs> So there is a certain motivation, unfortunately, often driven by economic purposes, not by human-led purposes or focus. This extrinsic motivation simply tells you that there is a certain part that you have to serve if you like it or not. And the extrinsic motivation is what often makes organizations move. They move too little, too late. However, at least they move. So the second part of motivational is the extrinsic motivation. The third part is the self-efficacy to adjust. So are you actually able to adjust what to, to, to what the market needs? And when you look into um when you look into statistics where people are asked who now leave school, where do you want to work? It is quite worrying that free enterprise now seems to lose out. Still, of course, many people want to go for free enterprise, but back in the days, and I'm not talking 20 years ago, I'm talking 10 years, five years ago, most people wanted to go for free enterprise and some people wanted to work in public service. Meanwhile, in the top 10 employers, depending on the country, you have three or four positions filled by the public sector. And when the public sector starts to outperform free enterprise, it is deeply, deeply worrying. However, often people say, in the public sector, there's a bit more regulation. So when people misbehave, there's an actual consequence. While in free enterprise, often there's no consequence. When a good manager or an excellent executive brings money to the table and they misbehave, there will be no consequence for that person. And of course, you will now say, no, 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 no. We have a process for that. We've all seen these processes. I only remember you. Bill Michael, who was the chairman at KPMG, had to step down due to massive amounts of misbehavior in his communication. You can find the article in the Financial Times about how Bill Michael of KPMG lost his job, telling, for example, that discrimination against women and minorities doesn't exist. Here we go. And these are highly qualified people, very intelligent people. They bring business to the table, and that's why they got away with these statements for way too long, because the only reason he lost his job was because someone recorded a meeting and leaked it to the press. So the self-efficacy to adjust, when you still think that you can get away with managers pretending to be someone who they are not, managers pretending that they're interested in diversity while they are not, managers or executives pretending that they are um, interested in some sort of diverse environment while they're only working in non-diverse circumstances, this will not work. Your self-efficacy to adjust must change to a very high level immediately. And that is the second part. We had, we had behavioral and we had motivational. The third part of the CQ is cognitive. And we have two subsets here. First subset, the general knowledge about culture. When you, for example, run a business which is focused internationally, then there is a massive difference. And now often now people say, well, I don't have any locations in uh, South America or Asia or Africa. That's not, I mean, of course, that, that, that could be an important part, but that's not what I'm talking about. When you are working in the U.S., and you stay inside the US and you talk about, let's say, work in New York, North Dakota, Texas, and California. You will have a massive difference in culture. When, of course, you talk, you, you're probably sitting in the UK and you probably um, have locations either in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland or Ireland, which does not belong to the UK, of course. So, massive difference in work culture. So, it's not about being thousands of miles away. You need, and that is the first subset, the culture, the general knowledge about culture. And here's a very important part. If you have external people either leading workshops or doing coachings or helping you in any way with that, 
people cannot help you on the general knowledge of culture when they have not lived in different countries. And I do not mean two weeks of business travel. I do not mean that you got sent as an expert for a couple of weeks, maybe for two or three months. That is not enough. I now lived in four countries, worked in more than 50. So it is very important that you live in different countries. Means live, you move there. Your center of life is there. You go to a different country. You get into the social system. You pay your taxes there. You get the social life. You get the real life of that country. And that cannot be done in theory or traveling with your mind or whatever people tell me. Either you've done it or you don't. There's a reason why large corporations, for example, the automobile industry in many countries say, when you want to go higher than middle management, you at least must live in a different country for two years. And that is the right decision to do because you will only get the culture, the general knowledge of a different culture when you've been there. And of course, you cannot live anywhere in the world. But when you once traveled or no, sorry, not not traveled, but lived in a different country, you will see that integration into different societies isn't as easy as you think. When you live in a certain country and people come to your country, people are very quick to say, oh, you should integrate to the country. That's your job to do. How hard that is, you will realize when you move to another uh, to another society. And then please do not live in your gated community with the other people of that company. So you only have basically a subculture of the people you lived with before. So you integrate it on a 0% level. So the first subset of cognitive is the general knowledge about culture. The second subset is the context-specific knowledge about a certain working culture. There's a difference if you have an automobile company or if you have a noodle company or if you run a fashion brand. And this knowledge, this is why we have interdisciplinary exchange that can be transferred by, for example, specific events or workshops or learning moments or simply working across industry, what quite quite a number of people have done. I did it in my in in my whole life, started in the pharmaceutical industry, um, then went into the tech sector, then went into soft skills and learning. So the full the full range here. And this context specific knowledge is something you learn. And again, there's no fast forward for experience. Be sure you have the experience. So this is cognitive, the third part. The fourth part is metacognitive. And me- metacognitive means that there are three subsets. Number one is planning. And planning means that you are properly putting things in place because you probably heard of people who said, oh, I'm very spontaneous. That's an important skill. Hear the news? It's not. There's a situative problem-solving approach, which is an important skill that when something happens, you are able in a certain situation to situatively solve a certain problem. That's important and that's much needed. However, being spontaneous is nothing else than the desperate and always in vain approach to socially justify your personal inability to plan. Planning means to put things into practice and make them happen. I always uh, get a very strange reaction when I tell people that on January 1st of 2023, I planned all the important events until 31st of December, 2024. I would prefer to do it for another year more, but that's not possible because expos and festivals and whatever else only announce their program normally for two years in advance. So all the important aspects where I know I have to take time off or I want to have the vacation, I planned two years in advance. That does not mean that there are no short-term spots available. Of course they are, because I know what the demands of my clients are. However, being able to plan is a critical skill, because otherwise, what you will do about culture is an all-talk, no-trousers approach. You will say culture is important, and we need to have a project here, and yeah, we should do something about that. Uh, Yeah, I I just write that down, and then I think we do something about that. Nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. So step number, so metacognitive, the fourth aspect here, the first subset of that is planning. The second subset is awareness. And awareness means that you have an awareness that was created in your organization. Please do not expect that people have this awareness by definition. You have certain people, and especially certain generations are way better at it in average, younger generations. They have a certain awareness of how important culture is because they demand a different culture at work. And they demand that there is not a culture where people say there is um, a, a chain of command and you have to obey. 
for example. I vividly remember how 20 years ago, so not that long ago, um, I had to wear suit and tie for no reason in office because some senior executive said, I like to have it that way. And back in the days, we were very obedient and we accepted that. If someone today would tell me you have to wear suit and tie to a workshop, I would invoice them to do so. I have no problem to do that. However, I need to get there. That's a full day you pay me. Then I have to buy all that. You pay me. I have to bring it all back because it's rented. You have to pay me. And suddenly, suit and tie is not important anymore. As soon as it costs money. You want me to wear that, what I'm normally not wearing, you pay for it. However, many organizations change today because they realize that people aren't really interested in working in a in a supply chain of commanders. Let's say that way. There's just a chain of command and you have to obey. The awareness means that there's an active approach of creating a sustainable awareness towards culture and the importance of culture and the relevance of culture on a talent market where shortage is the new norm and it will stay the norm for a decade or longer. And the third subset of metacognitive is checking. Checking means that you honestly care about did the change really happen? Because otherwise you only do tick the box culture. Tick the box culture means, oh, we have a project here and you all do this online course. Uh, please do it during your lunch break if possible or from home, that's cool. Uh, please do not um, put working time in there. And uh, yeah, we have a two day workshop as well. Please uh, I go to the meeting room on these two days and you get a certificate in the end and then we tick the box and, and now we have a great culture. Now we have everyone, everyone now is qualified about culture. And you know that in all, many organizations, this happens. Nothing changes, but people did a workshop and nothing changes. Checking means to truly care that change happens because people will very quickly realize when you care more about this tick the box approach than true change. So here we have the four main parts with different subsets. Behavioral with three subsets, verbal, nonverbal, and speech acts. Motivational with the subset of intrinsic, extrinsic, and your self-efficacy to adjust. Third one, cognitive. There is the general knowledge about the culture and the context-specific knowledge of uh, culture. And the fourth one, metacognitive, planning, awareness, and checking. All these four main factors together form what is called the CQ, the cultural quotient the cultural intelligence aspect. And when now someone says, because I can tell you it will happen in your organization, when someone says, oh, here we go, the new trend once more, um, let's see when this is going to disappear. I'm not interested because you always create trends. Or this is self-justification of HR or just a new hype on the market. Let's just ignore that. I can tell you that in the beginning of the 2000s, science already said we're going to have a talent shortage on the market in about 10, 15, 20 years time. And everyone was laughing at them. No one cared about science once more. Turns out, surprise, surprise, science was right because science works on works based on facts, proven evidence. And here we are with a talent shortage because no one did something about it. And when you now say this cultural intelligence approach, the CQ, the cultural quotient, is just another trend. Here are the news. Christopher Early, who is the professor and chair uh, of Department of Organizational Behavior at London Business School. If you don't know London Business School, they, for example, have a top 20 MBA. So it's one of the best business schools you can have in the world. And Elaine Moskowski, professor for management at the University of Colorado, Colorado and Boulder. They published at Harvard, Harvard Business Review. They published publicly, so it was available to anyone. You can't say you haven't seen it or it was behind closed doors or it was under review. No, no, public article available. They published in October 2004. So when you are now one of these executives who say, oh, I, I, Neil, I'm in the business for 30 years. I know how business is going. Don't tell me what I need to do. If you're in the business for 30 years and you never heard of the cultural intelligence, or you think it's just another trend or a hype, you obviously were hibernating or sleeping for the last 20 of your 30 years and probably should reconsider your position. Honestly, reconsider your position before it's too late. Because maybe you think that your organization doesn't know how anything should continue or go on without you, but maybe they will give it a try by next week. I'm not encouraging people to uh, fire executives based on this attitude. Anyone has the right to change. However, we see this is a relevant part of today's working life. It is not a trend. It is not something that was made up just out of thin air in the recent past. And when you take all these four aspects together, consider all the subsets, and then 
take an active approach, a proactive approach in your organization, you will find that the CQ, the cultural quotient, the cultural intelligence will drive your cultural fit, your interviews, and your approach to the talent shortage that we have at the moment, including the whole work culture to a way more positive approach. And that will have a long lasting, sustainable, positive effect on your organization. And of course, there are more publications on this. Uh, but first, I have to thank you. We once more rocked it. Top 100 in Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Yes, with the English-speaking podcast. Germans and are listening to this English podcast. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Um, thank you very much for listening. Just just, just perfect. Of course, when you now say, um, I, I still have a couple of questions, maybe. Could you please help me? Of course, just drop me an email. The last weeks were really great with people sending emails nb at nb-networks.com you also find the email in the show notes of this podcast nb at nb-networks.com just drop me an email and then we take it from there if you have something very specific uh, training speaking coaching consulting mentoring you need a project interim manager or you need you 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 have an event and you need someone to speak there or host it feel free to contact me as well, nb at nb-networks.com, but I'm also happy just to talk about your aspect that you like to talk about. Um, second one, I always say, um, register for the leadership letter, expert.nb-networks.com. Every Wednesday morning, you receive an email with free access to everything that I published. It is the only way to get free access to what I published because when you find it somewhere else, on the internet, you probably see a paywall and then you have to pay for it. So expert.nb-networks.com. It's the only way how to access anything I published for free. And the third aspect, and that's the most important one, apply, apply, apply what you heard in this podcast, because only when you apply what you heard, you will see the positive change in your organization that you actually want to have. I wish you all the best implementing these steps in your organization. Always happy to help. Feel free to contact me. And at the end of this podcast, there's only one thing left for me to say. Thank you very much for your time.